proudly we hail. New York City, where the American stage begins, here's another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Air Force's Tactical Air Command. Our story is entitled, The Replacement. This is the story of the planes that are the workhorses of the Air Force and of the men who fly these ships, as proudly we hail the troop carrier squadrons of the United States Air Force's Tactical Air Command. Our first act curtain will rise in just one moment, but first, many times a man is skilled in a particular job, yet unable to find a use for it. Has this happened to you? Are you a service veteran with a service gained skill that's just going to waste? Well, if you are, then listen to me. You may be able to put that skill to work as a member of the United States Air Force. Right now, the Air Force needs experience and know-how gained in all of the armed forces. If you possess one of the critical skills needed to keep America's air defense strong, you can put that experience to work in the Air Force and do so at a higher grade and with higher pay than you may realize. You've earned credits toward a valuable retirement income, so protect that initial investment. For full details, you write or visit your Air Force recruiter. Ask for the prior serviceman's folder. Now that's the prior serviceman's folder. This folder will show you why. Today and tomorrow, you're better off in the United States Air Force. And now your Air Force presents the proudly we hail production, The Replacement. if I sit down? Oh, uh, what, what did you say, Sergeant? I said, do you mind if I sit down here? Oh, no, not at all. It's just kind of noisy, and I didn't hear what you said. Yeah. It's so one thing about an airman's mess. There's always something doing. But you haven't heard anything yet. There's something special on tonight. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You know, when I saw you sitting over here in the corner, I decided maybe I'd better come over and have a little talk with you because, well, because I felt you have something on your mind, and I think I know what it is. But look, first, I'd like to tell you a little story. Okay? Well, well, okay, Sarge. Good. You know, it's funny, but it began about a year ago right in this very room during a farewell party thrown by my crew for Airman Jim Potter. And as it happened, I had the honor of making the farewell speech. And in conclusion, Jim, I know I speak for the crew when I say that as happy as they are that you're going to better yourself by being transferred to radio school, just as sorry are they to lose you. Right, fellas? Yeah! Now, we, we've been through a lot together, and your going's going to leave a hole that's going to be hard to fill, believe me. Anyway, now, in behalf of the crew, I want to present you with this watch. Oh, boy, there's one guy we're sure going to miss. Right, Sergeant Baker? You said it, Daly. You know, it's the first time I ever saw him at a loss for words. Well, I don't think he expected all this. I guess not. Boy's going to leave quite a hole, that's for sure. No other guy in the crew with his sense of humor always had a crack at the right time, you know, just when you need it. Don't I know. Guys like that are few and far between, Daly. You know, his sense of humor is like a... Well, it's like a pearl and an oyster. It only turns up once in a blue hey, moon. Hey, Sarge, you remember the time when he was coming up? While Sergeant Daly reminisced, I noticed a tall young airman, a stranger, standing nearby listening. And the way he kept glancing about him, I know he was looking for somebody, so when Daly finished... Hey, I'm <laughs> telling you, that was someday all right. What a guy he was. Was? Daly, you talk like he's departed from this veil of tears already. Ah, no. You keep on like this, you'll soon have me crying. Now, go on, have some fun. We want Jim to leave feeling good, yeah, you know? Okay, I'll see you later. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, uh, hello, Eamon. 
Anything I can do for you? Oh, uh, hello, Sergeant. Maybe you can. I'm, I'm looking for Sergeant Baker. Well, that's me. Oh, oh, well, uh, I'm Airman Henry Bush. The, uh, first sergeant said I could find you down here at the mess. Glad to meet you, Bush. What's on your mind? Well, I just got in an hour ago, and the first told me I'm to be your replacement for, uh, well, the guy you gave the watch to. For Potter? Were you here during the speech a while ago? Uh, yes, I, uh, came in while you were talking. Uh-huh. Well, then you know how much we thought of Potter. He was a good man. And, uh, well, I might as well let you know right now, you're gonna have a job filling his shoes. I'm, uh, I'm beginning to realize that. But look, if, if you try, and that's all I ask, I'm sure you won't have any trouble. Now, come on. You come along with me. We'll join the party, and I'll introduce you around. Well, uh, Sarge, thanks a lot, but I'm, uh, I'm kind of tired. Is it okay with you if I run on to bed? Huh? Oh, no, no, not at all, Bush. Sure, go ahead, get some shut-eye. Hey, that's kind of funny, you know. That makes you, uh, uh, bushed bush, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, good night, Sergeant Baker. <laughs> yeah. Good night. He didn't seem to get my little attempt at a joke, but I figured maybe he was just too tired. Next morning, I turned him over to my assistant, Sergeant Daly, while I headed for headquarters, where I had a lot of paperwork waiting for me. Being first engineer, that means I have quite a few records to keep up, and it took most of my time for a couple of days, so I didn't get to see much of the crew. But just when I was about finished, my ship commander, Major Williams, called me into his office. Sergeant, I've just been up to see the wing commander. We've got a job coming up. Yes, sir. And from the looks of it, this is going to be one that'll top all the others we've had. We're ready for anything, sir. What is it, cargo carrying? No. Troops. And it's going to be a long one. That's all I can tell you about it now. It's uh, pretty much hush-hush. I see. There'll be an initial briefing tomorrow morning, but in the meantime, you can proceed with normal long flight preparations. Will do, sir. Uh, when do you think we'll be taken off? Very soon. Within a day or two at the most. You might call it an emergency flight, Sergeant. Yep. Quite an emergency. Emergency is a word that always spells trouble of some kind for somebody, but for us, an emergency mission spells action. Like the time we flew to Pakistan with medical supplies, the year they had the terrible floods. Or in Operation Haylift, when we airlifted hay and grain food to starving cattle during a severe winter in the southwest. And now, once more, we were being called on. Carrying troops, Sarge? Yeah. Must be a maneuver coming up, huh? I don't know, Daly. Or when's the briefing? Tomorrow morning. Hey, Daly. Hmm? How's the new man, uh, Bush? How's he coming along? Bush? Uh, okay, I guess. Good willing worker, but... But what? Well, I, I don't know. Seems sort of down the dumps, you know? Oh, yeah? Well, uh, what's eating? I don't know. I don't know. Whatever it is, it's contagious. But I don't get you. Well, the crew. Maybe I'm imagining things, but they're not the way they used to be when Jim was around, lighting things up. I guess I was so used to seeing that... Grin and mug of his when they look at this guy's straight face. What? Well, they'll get over it, and so will Bush. All he needs is time to get oriented. I don't know, Sarge. I hope you're right, but you can't change a leopard's spots. If there's any place that teamwork is needed, it's on a plane like the C-124. When you've got a ship as big as a two-story house and it can haul two Greyhound buses, you can bet it isn't a one-man job to get and keep her in the air. It takes a bunch of men to work together like a... Like a high-precision machine. The only difference is men are not machines. You can't keep them at a high pitch merely by flicking a couple of switches or adjusting fuel mixture. Take something else. I don't know, call it what you want. Uh, morale, spirit, pep, it's gotta be there. Or else. So you can see why Daly was worried about Bush. The next morning at the brief... All right, everyone, all right. Give me your attention. All right. The mission this squadron will engage in calls for maximum security precautions. And those regulations will be enforced as of now. now. The primary purpose of your mission is to carry troops in flight, destination to be given later. But this is not to be a maneuver. I repeat, not a maneuver. The squadron will depart this afternoon across the continent to Westover Base. After refueling and rest, you will then proceed across the Atlantic the location in Europe where you will pick up your troop load. Navigators and ship commanders will see me after this briefing for flight plan instructions. Dismiss. As soon as the briefing was finished, we hustled out to the bulletin board. 
Clock time, 1,630 hours. Hey, it doesn't give us much time. No. Say, Sarge, what's he talking about, not a maneuver? You heard the man, same as I did, Adams. Well, what else could it be? Adams, yours not to reason why, yours but to do and fly, no. huh? So let's get going. We got business to take care of. Daly was right. This mission was going to mean business. But I was as much in the dark as the crew was. We only had eight hours till takeoff time, and during that time, the crew had to complete the pre-flight check of the Globetrotter from spark plugs to nose ramp and elevator raising mechanisms. It's a big job, but every item on the checklist has to have an okay beside it before we can take off. However, we finally were checked and loaded. With Major Williams at the controls, our ship lumbered down the flight line to position. Larson Tower, Air Force 54203, ready for takeoff. Larson Tower to Air Force 54203, clear for takeoff, over. AF 54203 to Larson Tower, roger. With a tremendous power of 15,000 horses turning our four engines, we were airborne in a few minutes on our way across the continent to the Atlantic coast. It was going to be a long flight, so after our primary in-flight check, I dropped back to see how the crew was getting along. Everything okay back here, guys? Good. You might as well relax a bit, get a long ride ahead of us. Uh, what do you say, Bush? How's it going? Okay, Sarge. How do you like the Globetrotter? Some ship, huh? Yes, yes, it is. Hey, Bush, you feel all right? Yeah, I'm okay. You sure there's nothing bothering you? No, no. Well, Sergeant Daly tells me he thinks you're down in the dumps about something. He did? Well, I'll, uh, I'll tell you, Sarge, it's my first time on a long flight and sort of new. Oh, first time, sure, but you'll get used to it. You know, after you're up a while, a funny thing begins to happen to you. <laughs> You, you don't ever want to come down again. Look, take a look down there through the window. We're going to be passing over the Rockies soon, and look, see how the ground is rising up in the hills. See it? Almost as if it was moving. You see what I mean? Yes, Sarge, I... I see. I could see that he didn't. He glanced out of the window, but he didn't seem much interested. Just polite and obliging. And even though I tried a little longer to snap him out of his glumness, I felt like I was talking to a brick wall, so I gave up, hoping that whatever was bothering him would wear off with time. Our night-long flight was uneventful. After we landed at Westover and had our debriefing, I stopped by at the PX to pick up some things I did. Anything else, Sergeant? Uh, no, that's all. Here you are. Yeah, thanks. Oh. Hiya, Sarge. Hi, Bush. Getting something, too, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you have? Uh, four candy bars, uh, this magazine here, and, and uh, that harmonica there. Harmonica, huh? So you're a musician, huh? Well, I, I play a little. No kidding. Hey, maybe you could... Hello, Sergeant. Bush, can I uh, have a carton of cigarettes? Hello, Major Williams. Well, uh, I'll be running along. Now, look, get yourself some sleep now, Bush. We've got a long trip ahead of us. Okay, Sarge. You said it, Sergeant. I've just come back from squadron operations. Anything new, sir? Come on over here a minute. Anything else, sir? Uh, no, no thanks. Hey, on. Thank you, sir. We've got some work to do. The troops we're going to carry will be combat ready. Combat ready? Uh-huh. And if you remember, they told us this was to be no maneuver. But, Major, we're not at war with anybody right now. That's right, Baker. We aren't. But <laughs> I don't get it. You will, Sergeant. You will. <laughs> You are listening to the Proudly We Hail production, The Replacement, and we will return in just one moment for our second act. Are you a service veteran? Well, then listen carefully, because this message is just for you. You may be qualified to enlist in the United States Air Force in a grade that will be a real surprise to you. If you possess one of the critical skills needed to keep America's air defense strong, the Air Force offers you an opportunity to put your skill to work and at a higher grade and with higher pay than you may realize. Right now, the Air Force needs experience and know-how gained in the armed forces. And now, thanks to the new Career Incentive Act, you can put your service gain skills to work to your best advantage by returning to the armed forces as a member of the Air Force team. Write or visit your Air Force recruiter for the special prior serviceman's folder. Now remember, that's a special prior serviceman's folder. It's full of important details. And you'll see why, today and tomorrow, you're better off in the United States Air Force. 
You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now we present the second act of The Replacement. To say I was puzzled when Major Williams said we'd carry combat troops is putting it mildly. You have to remember that that was in the spring of 1954 and our country was not at war anywhere in the world. I thought, though, that maybe the briefing the next morning would clear things up, but I was wrong. All we found out was that our first stop was Paris, France. And... In order to maintain security precautions, the ship commanders will open and read sealed orders after takeoff. That's all. Any questions? We had plenty of questions, at least I had. But they'd be answered later. In the dim hours of dawn, we once more boarded our ship and took off. On a mission that was going to turn out to be one of the most unusual I ever took part in. After we got squared away... Attention, all members of the crew. At ease, men. Here's the final dope on our mission. It's called Operation Valley High, and will take us completely around the world. We'll pick up a full load of volunteer combat paratroops in Paris. Those troops are French and will be flown by us to Indochina so that they may take part in the battle for Dien Bien Phu. From there, we will proceed to the Philippines where we'll pick up a cargo to be delivered to the States. If you've been reading the papers, I don't have to tell you what's going on at Dien Bien Phu, or that this mission is of vital importance. Lieutenant Johnson will give you the information later on our route. But our first stop is at Orly Field, Paris. Landing time, 1,800 hours. That's all. Dien Bien Phu. Isn't that where they're fighting the last-ditch battle, Sarge? Yeah, it is, Adams. And it's a tough one. Yeah. They're surrounded, and they've got something like 11,000 men left against maybe four times as many enemy. Sure sounds rugged. Does that mean we'll drop them there? I doubt it. From what I know, their landing strip's under fire already. It's probably not big enough anyway for the Globetrotter. We'll find out soon enough. Yeah, the sooner the better, Sarge. Yeah, the sooner the better. We'd find out, all right, but we had some traveling to do first. During the flight from Westover to Paris, the crew was a pretty thoughtful bunch, I can tell you. And this time, it wasn't because of their new colleague, Bush. On the way, we picked up some tailwinds and arrived a few minutes earlier than 1800. We could see the lights of Paris and the Eiffel Tower below us. But on that evening, they were just the lights of another city. AF-54203 to Orly Tower. Final approach, gear down and locked. Over. The Major brought the ship around a beautiful approach turn, and the Globetrotter touched down in a perfect landing. While she was being refueled, I finished filling out my flight and fuel records and then reported to the crew shack. Sergeant, there's hot chow for you and the crew in the mess hall, and after that you can grab some sleep. Right, sir. They'll have the troops here by then ready to load. Is Sergeant Daly all set for them? Yes, sir. Good. See you then. 0600. 0600 hours. 6 a.m. And it's no different there in Paris than it is back in the States. Gray, chilly. Our ship has been pre-flighted. Everything is ready, waiting for our payload. In a few minutes, the buses pull up. There's no dawdling around. The nose ramp of our ship is down, and with daily supervising, the tough-looking French paratroopers, 220 strong, are marched up and into their seats along the two load decks. The nose ramp is raised. In a few minutes, we're airborne. With 8,500 miles to go. I ran to my desk, checking the engine and flight performance, then turned it over to the second engineer while I dropped down to take a look-see below. Everything's under control here, Sarge. Too much, if you ask me. Too much? Elucidate, Daly. Well, it's those Frenchies. Well, since they come on board, there hasn't been a peep out of them. They all look as glum as Bush does. Well, uh, maybe they got a reason to. I guess they have. Now, look, Sarge, we've carried plenty of troops before. You know how they sort of... Yak it up among themselves. Yeah, and it's good, too. It helps them to uh, relieve their tension. Exactly. These guys just sit in their seats, period. Come on, take a look. You see what I mean? Just sitting there looking at the floor. Yeah. Who's in charge of him? That guy over there. I think he's a sergeant. I'll talk to him. Um, <clears throat> hello, sergeant. I'm Sergeant Baker, crew chief. Bonjour, mon sergeant. Uh, you speak English? Uh, only little. Uh -huh. Um, how you men feel? Feel? Oh, 
They feel not good. Uh, for quoi? The, uh, the battle, the ambient feu. We think maybe we've come too late. Oh, oh. Well, uh, Sergeant, we'll, we'll do our best to get them there as fast as we can. Now, look, if they want anything, just let us know, okay? Merci. Okay. See what I mean, Sarge? Yeah, yeah. They're depressed. And for guys that are soon going to be on the front line, huh? I know what you mean. There ought to be something that can be done to buck them up. Yeah, sure, but what? I mean, even if we did know the languages, nobody in the crew you could call a gloom chaser now that Potter's gone. Yeah. Boy, we could use him now. While Daly and I stood there talking, Bush passed by us going down the line of men and pouring hot coffee for him. As he bent down to pour a cup for the French sergeant, I saw something that started the wheels turning in my head. Hey, Bush. Yes, yeah, Sarge? I uh, just saw your harmonica sticking out of your shirt pocket. I, uh, I got an idea. You know, these guys are going to be in a tough spot very soon. They need some cheering up. How about playing a couple of tunes for them, huh? Me? Well, gosh, Sarge, I don't know. I'm, I'm not too hot on the harmonica. So what? Play what you know. Well, I, uh, I still got to finish pouring this coffee. Well, I'll take over for you. Well, okay, I'll try. Uh, what'll I play? Anything. Well, let me think a minute. Uh, hey, how's this? Oh, no, 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 no. That's too sad. It's too slow. Play something lively. Oh, uh, well, let me see. Uh, something lively. Okay. Hey, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Come on, loud and strong, Bush. Keep it loud and strong. Just about then, I got a call from the flight deck, a little trouble with one of the generators. I got it straightened out and then took over from my second engineer for the next two hours. When my tour of duty was finished, you can bet I headed for the ladder down to midship right away. As I got halfway down the ladder, I could hear above the roar of the engines. I looked around the deck and what a difference. Instead of being gloomy and grim, they were now laughing and singing along with all the guys in my crew. Instead of besides the hatch leading down into the lower deck so that both decks could hear, was Airman Bush's face red and eyes sparkling, blowing his head off. Come along, will you join in? I don't know the words, Daly, or I'd be glad to. Don't worry about that. The French sergeant will teach them to you. Come on. Okay. Oh, Whoever said music was a universal language knew what he was talking about. For the rest of the trip to Indochina with stops for refueling and rest, the French paratroopers were relaxed and cheerful. And in sign language and pidgin English and French, they swapped experiences with the guys in my crew. There were a lot of friendships started that trip. Some that continued up till now by letter and others that, well, were cut short soon after. And then at last, we were flying over Indochina. Attention, crew and passengers. Stand by prepared for any emergencies. That is all. A few minutes later, we landed safely at the field. And in a matter of seconds, the Globetrotter's nose ramp was lowered. And the French paratroopers started disembarking. As they did so, Airman Bush pulled out his harmonica and standing at the head of the ramp, I can tell you, that was one straight-back proud bunch of soldiers that marched down that ramp. And as the sergeant, who was the last one to leave, came by Bush, he stopped. Merci, mon commandant. Merci. He stepped back one pace, saluted Bush, then turned around smartly and followed the others down the ramp. And as he passed by me, I saw tears glistening in his eyes. And I knew without looking that his weren't the only eyes they were just a little bit damp. That was the last we saw, but not the last we heard. Shortly after they left, we again took off and continued to Clark Field in the Philippines. As soon as I got the chance, I got hold of Bush. Yes, Sarge? That was a great job you did with that harmonica. You know, that's something I bet a French general would give his right arm to be able to do. 
to be able to relax those men and, you know, renew their courage. Well, anybody could have done it. I'm, I'm glad I was able to help. I'm, I can see you are. Hey, you, you, feel, you feel better now than you did before, right? Yes, Sarge, a lot. Bush, tell me something, will you? What has really been bothering you since you joined up with us? Well, Sarge, I, I don't mind telling you now, but that first day in the EM club when I, when I talked to you, remember? Yeah, I remember. Well, I heard what you and Daly said about the guy I was replacing, and from the way the crew felt about him, I, I thought I'd never be able to fill his shoes. Boy, you have filled them already. <laughs> As of now, you are officially and otherwise a full-fledged member of this crew, and it'll be a sad day if we ever have to lose you. Well, that just about finishes it. I said then it would be a sad day if Bush ever had to leave us. Well, this is that day. That's the crew you hear marching into the club now with Bush. We're going to have another farewell party. It's for Bush this time. He's being transferred to another C-124 as assistant crew chief. And when I saw you standing here, I figured you were Bush's replacement, right? That's right, Sergeant. Well, I, I thought I'd tell you his story so you'd know you'd have a chance to do just as well as he did in filling another man's shoes in the greatest crew and the greatest ship in the world, the Globe Trotter. Come on, let's go and meet him. When you make an investment, you want it to pay off, right? Well, fellas, how about those years you invested in the service, learning skills, gaining experience valuable to yourself and your country? You can make those years pay off in big dividends today by becoming a member of the United States Air Force. Yes, indeed, if you've been in any of the armed forces, you may be eligible to enlist in the Air Force in a gray that'll be a real pleasant surprise to you. You see, the Air Force needs men skilled in certain important fields, and you may be just such a man. If so, the Air Force offers you an opportunity to put your previous service experience to work and to collect on those credits you've earned toward a comfortable retirement. Your Air Force recruiter has a folder full of details, so you write or visit him right away. Ask for the prior serviceman's folder. Today and tomorrow, you're better off in the United States Air Force. Another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this radio station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center in New York for the United States Air Force. And this is Dick Herbert speaking, and inviting you to tune in to the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs> <laughs>